It's good to be in God's house. Uh, another time we have come to the week. Um, we want to look at Second Samuel, the ninth chapter. Are you hearing me today? I'm not. I'm not hearing myself too much. <laughs> One, two, three. Good. Uh, it's a little better. Uh, the sound uh, custom hearing. Second Samuel nine. Last night, what we talked about. You remember? Last night, what we talked about. Huh? The man, just, the, tonight I'm introducing another layman from, my subject come from the 12th verse, and I hope you know the story so I don't have to work too hard. <laughs> yeah, I hope you know this story so that once you know the story, it helps. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to come in your presence to deliver your word. May you have your way in this church. Come by here. In Jesus' name. Amen. David is an interesting character. In the scripture. David is the one that exclaimed in sin that my mother conceived me. I'm aware the way in which theologians interpret that text. But there are always four levels of looking at any text or scripture. In sin did my mother conceive me suggest that is the original sin he was talking about. He was talking about the sin that Adam and Eve committed and thus in sin he was conceived. But if you dig the surface of the text a little further, he was actually saying, in sin did my mother conceive me, meaning she did commit either adultery or fornication. And I know that is true because when Samuel came to anoint a king, he was left out because there was a, a cultural thing that the bastard child should not be in the congregation. And so David was always ostracized and alienated from the family of God, even his own family, because he was not conceived right. But oftentimes in scripture, the person who is in the backside becomes in the forefront. God has a way of having a reversal. The people who we approve is oftentimes the people God rejects. Because we have a tendency of judging from the sight when God looks at the heart. So even though David was the eighth son of Jesse, and I, and, and I also know what I'm saying is a truer interpretation of the text because when you read the passage, they were trembling when Samuel said he's coming. And if you understand the culture, they would not have left out his son if that son was not marked in a way for death. So God has a way of bypassing those who look like they should and choose another. In fact, when Jesus demonstrated what I'm saying, he was stoned on the Sabbath, or they tried to pull him over a cliff to kill him, Jesus. Church members, tithe pain, Sabbath keeping, health reforming people wanted to kill Jesus when he said, in the days of Elijah, there were many lepers in Israel. And the prophet was not sent unto them, but was sent into Naaman. Naaman was a, was a captain in ben Haddad army. And ben Haddad was killing church members. ben Haddad was killing Seventh-day Adventists. 
And so and so, as far as my theology goes, I will say, Mr. Chairman, I shall move that you don't go to a man who is killing us. But Jesus says that in the days of Elijah the prophet, he went unto those outcasts and he did not come to the lepers in Israel. It tells me that God is not a Jewish God, neither is he an Adventist God. He's a God of all flesh. And therefore, man, man must not feel that they are in possession of God. You know? So God is my God, and God is my church God. And so based on how I know he should behave, he behaves. And that is why God wants to operate in my church, but he can't because our minds are so boxed our way he works. And so when Jesus, the exegete of God, the example of God, the walking God, when he came, he said in the days of Elijah, they did not go to the church. They went to the outcasts. And then he said, there were many widows in Israel. And they did not go unto the church widows, but into a widow of Zarephath. Are you with me, church? And when he said that, they got angry because it has always been the problem of folks who think they are the chosen of God, that they believe because we are the chosen of God, we are the only people of God. And so there was an attitude of despising those and he has a tendency of bypassing the, the seven brothers and go for the eight son. <laughs> not, 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 not you Cain, but Abel, the second son. Not you Esau, but you Jacob, the second son. Not you Manasseh, but Ephraim, the second son. Not you the firstborn, but the prodigal who have left. Yes, yes, you. Yes, I know it go against your theology and the way in which you consume the scripture. But when I look, there is a trend of God to choose the outcast, Jephthah, the son of a harlot. Yes, that is the one. Come and do work for me. God is a God that is not boxed by any church. He's not boxed by any theology. And if you look at scripture carefully, you will notice he chooses those people to work with him who your board will reject. I will never have used Moses in my congregation because he had blood in his hand. He killed a man and fled. And I see nowhere where he actually repented. So how can he lead people and he's a murderer? But God. But God who weighs are different and above the way in which we think. And it is that Jesus I've been presenting every night. And I know he troubles people. The real Jesus troubles people. Because when he was on earth and he spoke to the chosen ones, they were the ones that resisted him the most. And the publicans and sinners, those adulterers and fornication, yeah, wait a minute, like Zacchaeus and those thieves, they were the ones that embraced the Jesus. And those who kept the Sabbath and sing songs in his name and preach the gospel, those who were the repository of the spirit of prophecy they had the oracles of God those who believed that they were given the message for that time those were the ones who rejected Jesus it tells me something just belonging and having a name is not sufficient I need to have a connection with God and I found with the 54 countries that I've been and the thousands of Adventist churches that are preaching there are people believe that they're just they are saved by just belonging and those who don't belong are lost Oh, there's a Pentecostal, so they don't understand. And we believe that that, that that is about just understanding. If it was just about understanding to be saved, then bright people would just go in the kingdom. But, 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 but it's always those like Moses who had a stuttering tongue that he will use to speak. God is a God that needs to defy the logic of the lawyers of the law, the doctors of the law, those who can articulate and orate the, 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 the doctrines of the church. He always go against what they think and work. That is why I've told you he uses an unclean bird to feed a prophet defies the logic of scripture in order to confuse those who think they know. 
this is how God works in here. This is how he always been. You can never raise your hand. You can never do this. You can never do that and be saved. You can't eat meat and do this. And all this can't, can't, can't. And God is just saying, not you, not you. You think, by the way, that is why when he comes, you will say, oh, master, I have cast out demons and I, and I have done this and I fed the poor. And I've and said, get away from me. You never knew me. You know works. You behave in a way in church for men to see who you are and you parade yourself with your big hat and your long dress and your vegetarian self. And you thought that was salvation, but, but, but you rejected that woman at Samaria who had several husbands and she, she yeah, you rejected her. You, you believe, but if, watch me, watch me, watch me church, but, but the 12 disciples that were great theologians and can articulate the text. They went in the village and they brought back a, a, a fish sandwich for Jesus. And he didn't eat it. But this woman who was of dubious character, this woman when she left his presence, never went to Andrews University or Barrington to study theology. She didn't even know too much the doctrines of the church. But when she encountered Jesus... If you ever meet Jesus in that very moment, because he is truth, by virtue of your interaction with him, he impregnates you with himself. And so that woman immediately went in a village and not just bought a fish sandwich for him, she brought a village for Jesus and she knew nothing about the Sabbath in a sense that I'm talking about, but she encountered the real Jesus. Church, my first announcement, don't feel no comfort with your doctrine that you articulate with your mouth unless you walk this walk you're no way in fact you're worst off mm, i'm going somewhere this is my last night to to mash your foot <coughs> mm? before i leave let me get heavy on your toes mm? so jesus always bypass those so david Look at how he chooses church. Eh, 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 preacher, preacher, by the way. Um, Mr. Chairman, I so move that you don't use Hannah, eh? You know, you know. Hannah has a very, you know, in a situation. Hannah, in a situation where her husband has two wives, and you know, according to your original plan, that is unacceptable. So so you can't, you, you, you shouldn't even listen to her prayer. But out of that womb that will be rejected came one of the greatest prophets that ever lived. If he was going by what your theology teaches and what your way or what your church manual suggests, then we will never leave room for a God. We have boxed God in as a people too much. And God wants to say, leave me, let me operate with my people. Give me room. You are not the boss inside of here. <laughs> I am the God of Israel. I'm the God of all flesh. So right through scripture, you see him defying logic, choosing people who don't fit the mold. The second son. David finds himself in a category of people in sin did my mother conceive me. I was not born in a right place. I want to make an announcement for those of you women who have children out of wedlock. And yes, you have sinned and they know. Don't worry. God has a way of blessing those very children that seems to be outcast and rejected. You just keep sticking with Jesus. Trust me on that one. You just keep sticking with Jesus. Some of you bear guilt forever. Mm. Some of you, and, and, and by the way, women pay a greater sexual price than a man. That is why when the woman was caught in adultery, the man could still go in the pulpit and preach and say hallelujah when she's rejected. But you know what? Women have a tendency because she's born with a more sensitivity to the gospel. And I believe, and I, this is just my belief, that I'll see more women in heaven. I uh, thank you, women, for at least saying amen. The men might be vexed with me, but uh, and most of the men know they had a very godly mother. These mothers of Israel, 
These mothers of Israel, it, when they bite their teeth into something, they wrestle with the devil until you come back. Eh? Is there any mother in this house? Even though when those children stray, you are there with prayer, prayer and you pray and you pray until it is easier for a man to walk away than a woman. I want to just make an announcement because I had a wonderful mother. No offense to men. I'm a father myself, but I thank God for you. Those mothers are wonderful, I must confess. They are beautiful creatures. Eh? Uh, when I watch both male and female, I know there is a God when I watch how God made these mothers. David, David said, in sin, did my mother conceive me, ostracized and rejected, left in the backside of the desert to shovel sheep down. And even though he had a shepherd's clothes, he was a king. Oftentimes, God will clothe a king <laughs> you will have a king anointed in sheep clothes and men will not discern who you are. But God often train you in, in, in obscurity to bring you to notoriety. You will first be trained in a desert before you are brought to preach and teach and minister. And so never despise small beginnings. Never despise your service in Sabbath school, your service in Pathfinder. God is training you for greater things. He will train you to kill bears and fight lions in the desert. So when he brings you to deal with kingdom, you could treat with it. Some people are too hurry. I often said Jacob had the right, the birthright, but he was not ready. Hear me, church? Sometimes you have the right, but you are not ready. Those of you who have land to pass on to your children, and even though they are the rightful heir, they have rights, but they may not be ready. Oftentimes, God has to make you ready to receive. And to make you ready to receive, he oftentimes calls you. Watch me, church. He calls you David. He calls you Joseph. He calls you Jesus. And then he makes your brothers reject you first. Every man and God in Scripture, you name one of them. David, when he came the first time, he was rejected by his brothers. But when he came the second time, he was received by his brothers. Because the whole Scripture is a pattern of Jesus who came to his brothers. And the first coming, they rejected him. But the second coming, he will be received because he will come as King of kings and Lords of lords. When Joseph first went to his brothers in Doten, they rejected him. But when they meet him in Egypt, they received him a second coming in other words everybody that is called of God will first first rejection before they are accepted accept your rejection you must re accept rejection and know it's part of the process most of the great singers of this world or like Michael Jordan who was a basketballer they were first rejected before they was even accepted don't don't allow people rejection of you to define who you are Moses was first rejected when he went to his brothers he was so enthused he killed a man because of his brothers and they reject him he had to be running away but when he came back to the Pharaoh the second time they received him Moses is a pattern of scripture I told you the scripture should be seen as patterns not just a text that you extract to build a doctrine are you following me church when God allows you to be rejected by your brothers the next step you're you're chased in a wilderness for you to learn because oftentimes the wilderness is a place where God trains those beasts of burdens with a lot of books and head knowledge because Moses was trained in Egyptian theology and understanding. He was trained, but his real training for work was in a desert. God will isolate you from all your degrees. He will give your family a problem that your psychology and medical science and all that will not solve. Your daughter or your son will bring a problem in the house and no amount of bringing those black books and brown books to read. They're not listening because God God wants to really teach us what it is to be wrestling with him. He will call you, cause you to be rejected, and I'll send you in the wilderness. Jesus was called. The dove came down from heaven, and God says, Thou art my beloved son. And then he was led into the wilderness. The wilderness, let me tell you something, brother Abu. Jesus never said, I am the good shepherd. I am the life. I am the bread. Until he came out of a wilderness. You read it in scripture. You only know who you are when you come out of a wilderness it is when you come out of being tried and tested of God you now know who you are 
Jesus did it, Moses did it, David did it, you name them. They went into a wilderness, Joseph, before. So David was called of God, and he was called. He was anointed by Samuel, even though his brothers thought he couldn't do it. And David was chosen by God, not because he was the best, but because he was considered the worst. Be careful how you, how you treat people who are considered worst. Because oftentimes, if you look at scripture, they are the anointed ones. Anointed, this church can preach about a dead David. A David that has died thousands of years ago in the scripture, but we have never been able to treat with a living David who has a woman problem and a temper problem and all that and still treat him with respect because God, when you see now, he sees in potential. Let me tell you what I mean when I see God sees in potential. He said, thou art Phesus, thou art Cephas, but thou shalt be. When he called Peter, he said, thou art but thou shalt be. What church members see is who you are. What God sees is who you will be. Oh God. I wish somebody could say amen. What man sees who you are. What Jesus sees is who you will be. He sees in potential. And because he sees in potential, he called those things that are not as if they were so that it could become what he says. So don't make men put their mouth on you. You listen to what God says you are and whoever he says. Because you will look like. So what I'm saying, church, hear me well and hear me good. Be careful how you judge people like me because there are living Davids around that God never removed from his throne even though there was a sword in his family because when you are anointed when you are anointed when you are anointed you have to be careful how you need with treat with anointing individual because anointing and sinlessness is not necessarily the same because oftentimes God called you and then he worked out of you what he put into you and while he's working out his life in me, be careful how you judge me when you see me stumble. Because stumbling is part of the process. Saints don't fall down. And even if you consider it fall down, a saint, listen to me church, a saint is a person who is going up in an elevator. So you are falling down in an elevator going up. I need to say that again. A real Christian is a person who is falling down but in an elevator going up. Mm? So be careful, be careful what you see with your eyes. God don't judge like you because it is these failures. In fact, I can tell you, my success in my life is not based on the things that I did good. Real success, if you check the fabric for which your success has been weaved, is your failure. So we need to redefine what failure is. In fact, when Jesus was about to die and he was about to face his worst nightmare, he said, this is my finest hour. This is the hour of glory. In other words, church need to redefine success. He did not say when he opened the blind man's eyes, this is his finest hour. He didn't say when he raised Lazarus, that was his finest hour. He didn't say when he, he put back the man's ears, that was his finest hour. When he was about to die and go down, he said, that's my real time. Except a corn of grain. <laughs> Except a corn of grain goes into the ground and dies. It abides alone. But if it dies, that is why when people are building a big building, you go for months and all you see them is digging down before they can go up. That is how God is. When he calls you as a person, when he calls you as a family, when he calls you as a church, oftentimes he's digging down. So if people come and peep, they will see you going down. But except you go down, you can go up. And the greater you have to be elevated is the lower you will go down. And so I've been a stumbling man all my life. I've been a person who was born with issues. But, but God, but God, David, 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 for which my text, David, <laughs> rejected, ostracized. But, but, but the scripture says he was a man after 
glory of heaven. And, and let me suggest to us tonight that when it says that David was a man after God's own heart, it does not mean that David was a man whose heart was like God. In fact, it was the opposite. His heart was black. His heart cannot be like God. But that word after in the Hebrew means he was a man that was after God. He was a man that was pursuing God. He was a man that blew kisses to God. He was a man that wrote poems to his God. A man that is in pursuit of his God. Yes, I have adultery in my life. Yes, I have a Bathsheba, but I'll not let you go, Jesus. I'm, I, I'm keep coming after you. That's a man that is after God's heart. And God is looking for men that are after his heart. In spite of your failures, in spite of your flesh, you're still saying, Jesus, I'm coming. I'm, I'm come. I can't. If it's not you, Jesus, I, I need to hold on to you. That's a man after God's heart, and that's a man God chooses to do big things. A man who is in pursuit of him. Are you with me, church? A man who is in pursuit of him. So David, David went through many battles, and when you have an anointing on your life, you will have a lot of enemies, and there will always be a soul in your life. <laughs> soul always have a javelin, and you know why? That is why sometimes when I preach, I just leave. I hardly want to talk to women in particular because when the women in the church begin to say, Saul has killed, oh God, <laughs> you be careful. It's okay for, for the men to say, talk about a good preacher. You see like a good preacher comes and wants, oh yeah, 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 yeah. You see, you see men can say, oh, good sermon. But when the woman in the church begin to say, Saul has killed his thousand, but David has killed his ten thousand. Then when the woman begin to say that Saul brings out his javelin, you say, huh? You will take my glory? <laughs> I can't allow you to take my glory. And a lot of times in our churches, and in our, when we display our gifts, you have egos operating in our system. It's about egos, but the, but, but the Bible says you don't compare yourself with any man for so doing you are not wise. If you operate in your gift, the scriptures say your gift will open doors. It is David's gift of being able to wind up a sling and throw it at the enemy that opened the palace door for him to eat the food and learn the etiquette of the kingdom. It is that is your gift. That open doors, not your jockeying for position, not your just wanting to fight. When you operate in your gift, it opens doors. And you don't have to compete with any man. You just serve in silence. And God will bless you anyway. Are you with me, church? So David is a model. So Saul throw javelin at him. And oftentimes, the king that is on the throne is not even the king that God wants to use. The king of the church is in a wilderness, shoveling sheep down and smelling mess. And the man that is there may not be the real one. He's just occupying. Because God will often allow another person to occupy until you are ready. He told Joshua, and they said, don't worry, I will not kill all the Hittites and all these people, else least beasts and animals overrun the land. All those scriptures are there. Incrementally, I will bring you into your place of settlement. Are you with me, Chief? That is why we must not be hurried for power, because God is preparing. So there is no need to fight anybody. Are you with me, church? Just, 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 just bear with me as I meander through my text. David, so David now eventually has a, <laughs> he has a staff. <laughs> he has a staff of what the scripture called mighty men. But you, God built his army in a wilderness. These men were the bank robbers and thieves and killers of his day. If you read the scriptures carefully, the staff of David was not good men, but eventually in the wilderness they became good. You see, the point I'm trying to make, you know, we have a, a, a standardized model all over the world. I hear it in the Caribbean, in North America, in South America, in Africa, and all these places, good and regular standing. And because I have an inquisitive mind that, that search beyond what word says, I always ask, what do you mean by good and regular standing? What, what do you really mean? Because when I look at scripture to the men that he called and he used, and I wonder if they will fit the criterion in which we put Man, I, I am confused, but I, I see guys like Noah. He called Noah. And yes, you see, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, but as soon as Noah came out the ark, he got drunk in debauchery. 
I, I, I wonder to the vicissitudes and, and, and movements of men and the, and the way we fall and stumble. What is the standard? Is it that God just wants people to just love one another and pray for one another? And yes, I know you think that there is an issue of discipline. And discipline is part of it. But I want you to watch at God because God is the ultimate. He's the ultimate aperture of how to treat. If you want to know how to treat with people, you look at how God treats. You look from Genesis. Genesis to Revelation, and you look and see, has he extended more mercy than he extended? And even when he seems to cut, he put grace. He said, I will, I will mix it with some grace to, so, that, so that you can still stay in the family. Are you, are you with me, church? He says, he say, it's okay what people think. We, 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 we in the family, Adam, it's, it's okay. I will, I will send you out of Eden. I will put you out. I will excommunicate you. But the text says, and a river ran out of Eden. And a river ran out. He's actually saying, even though I put you out, I have a system in place. So as soon as you leave the door, I have a system to get you back in. Because I can't lose all that thou has given me. I have lost none. I don't want any one of you. I'm here. Are you with me, church? Yeah, yeah. So David, David, David. So David eventually passed through. He was anointed king over Judah, but not until seven years or so after he was anointed king over the whole of Israel. For most of his life, he was running from a soul. Hear me good. There will always be a soul in your life who runs down you to kill you. Saul is there to make you better. Let me make an announcement. Saul is like manure for you to grow. Any problem you have in church and problem you have with people, you must see them as manure and you must thank them because it's them who cause you to draw nutrients. Even though they may smell funny, they're still good for you. We're just talking. Don't look so serious, man. I am having fun. You're looking so serious. Let me, let me take a little break or a drink of water. You, and we are just having fun in the world. And you're, this man, wonder what this man can. No, no, no. I have no agenda. The only agenda we have here night after night is what the Holy Spirit set. And by the way, let me take this time to give a disclaimer. And I want you to know because I know Elder Abu has been very worried because he has been expressing worry. That people may think because he's the host and he's hosted me that he has been talking to me. But I stand before you tonight. I know nothing about your business and that is why I'm enjoying my preaching. Because wherever, <laughs> wherever the chips fall, let them fall because he has told me nothing. And he has been very concerned. Oh, Elder, you know what you said tonight? People may think, it's okay. He said, Elder, what you said tonight? You pointed at people. What you said? No, no, no. He has not told me anything. I've just been preaching what God has put on my heart. Let the chips fall where they may. David now is king. Now my sermon is from 2 Samuel chapter 9, 12 verse. So just stick with me. I'm going to hurry because I'm watching the clock. Or could I just take my time and preach as we come into there? Could I just preach this thing? Just preach. Good, good, good. Watch me. So now, he's now king over Israel. He now has time. Yes. And, and, and I wish I had time to talk about Delilah. I mean, not Delilah. Um, Bathsheba. 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 I wish I had time, but let me just make one point on Bathsheba before I move. There is a psychology. The way in which I read my Bible, you know why I remember the scripture? One, because I switch off the Nigerian movies. That's one reason. And secondly, secondly, I, I don't watch this. I, I don't watch those things because I find the scriptures full of intrigue. But what I do, I tell my young people who I mentor and train in scripture, I sit in the text. Get a chair and sit. If you want to understand the word more profoundly than superficial, sit in the text. Become the character. Feel what Amnon will feel to go on to his sister. Live the character. Sit in the text and meditate on it. Feel what it is to Bathsheba because Bathsheba, the psychology of sleeping with a powerful man is powerful. You see, you can just sit in, sit in the text and feel what you, oh, you know, I have a little thing with the king. <laughs> huh? 
You, you, even though I, I, I want to, I want to stop, you know, because it's, but King David. Mm. And, and, and you may be laughing, but it may exist right here. You are a nice little girl in the congregation. You're 25 years and you have a David in your life. You know. And the psychology of the affair. But that is for Sunday morning. You come Sunday morning. Let's talk the real talk. <laughs> come Sunday morning. We'll talk the real talk. Let me stop. This is Sabbath. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Are you, are you with me, church? Yes. So, so, so. So David is now king and he has now has power over all Israel. It doesn't matter how long it takes, but God will fulfill his word. You see, if he tells you you'll be king, you will be king. And let me prove it. Even when Jonah was trying to run away, God put a hook in, in a sense in his mouth and bring him back there. You know what God is faithful to? God is faithful to his word. That is why I tell people, you don't need a word from Jane or you don't need a word from Jerry or you don't need a word from Kimani. You need a word from God because God is faithful to his word. He said, I will not allow my word to come back unto me void. So if Jonah, I tell you, you have to preach, you better go and preach. And because God is faithful to his word, he will pursue you relentlessly, not because you're good, but because you have word. It's important to have a word. And I know it is a word because he said, it should not return unto me void. Wait a minute, preacher. Go beyond a little deeper in that text. That is why when Jesus, who is the ultimate word of God, he is the word of God when he was resurrected because the Bible says the word will not return void. When Jesus, the word went up, the graves were open and people, oh God, you know what I talk about. That's, that's what the text really means. That's the real meaning of the text. The word cannot return void. And so when he went up, he had to carry people. So it's important to have a word in your life <laughs> that God will be pursuing. And even when you're in the club, you know as a seven year I have backslidden before. So I know what it is to backslide. You know when you backslide as an Adventist, you want to sin plenty quick because you know you don't belong. Let me talk to this side. Is there any young people inside of here who know when you kind of backslide and you're going to the club, you want to do everything because you know you're uncomfortable, eh? Because God will make you uncomfortable in the club. Mm, you did dancing, but you, ah, no, no, no. So you want to sin hard and fast. Ah, like I thought some court. Some people saying, yes, it's me. Yes, yes, yes. It's the first point I say, and it sounds like I speak the truth. So, so, so David is now king, and he's, he's over Israel. Now watch me. Watch. But David had a covenant with Jonathan. I'm transitioning now in my text, so you can put 2 Samuel chapter 9 up. I don't have time to go to every verse. I wish I had, but I'll skip and I want you to read. But he had a covenant with John, Jonathan. That um, Jonathan knew that David was the anointed one. And even though he was the one by birth, he should have been the king. But David was the chosen one. And, and, and that is a thing in scripture. So the chosen one emerged and Jonathan was willing to concede to David. And they made a covenant, and covenant is very important. We talk about that Sunday morning as well, why powerful covenant is. But they had a covenant together. And let me fast forward the scripture. And so, the days when Saul and David's house was fighting, the soul of David and the, the house of David and the house of Saul were fighting, Saul died. And as Saul died, the nurse, watch me. Here's where I'm going to start to really preach. That was my introduction. I want to get your mind engaged. Please bear with me. Don't sleep on me tonight. If you're sleeping, that's a demon. If you're sleeping on this word, that's a demon. Trust me. Ellen White says the demon comes and they fan you. Because the point. Make sure and stay awake. And if you're sitting next to somebody, you see nothing, give them an elbow. <coughs> it's just, it's so, 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 he's now, and the nurse, yes, the nurse, the nurse, the nurse. So, while they had the war, and the nurse, 
realized that there is war, she grabbed Mephibosheth and was running with Mephibosheth to get away. And she dropped Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth became crippled. Now, I want you to fit, sit in the text. She, to be a nurse, to nurse a prince, is that you're well qualified. You are a real good nurse. You went to school and you have qualified. And you who are charged with that prince dropped him. There are some parents inside of here. You have dropped your child and, that, and for years you, you, you have been running. You, you did something and for years you are suffering with guilt, with a guilty conscience because you dropped I always follow me. I'm, I'm, I'm not starting to watch me, Pete, church, because I, I want to come after parents. Parents, I want you to listen to me. Yes, we know. But let me tell you something, mothers and fathers. Even though your child has been dropped and they are crippled because of you, stop carrying guilt. Because when you read this passage, you'll realize that God has provision for every mistake that you could ever make. Yes, you have been an angry father in your house. And you think because you have been an angry man, you suffer from guilt in church because you see your son as an angry man too. And you're very pained and you come to church and you keep carrying guilt. Just wait for the story to end. Are, are you with me, church? And, and so some of you nurses inside of here, some of us parents, we dropped our kids. And, 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 and because we dropped them and we watched them broken, it's the guilt of our lives. And we, we just watch these children and we are watching them and guilt. Some of your faces have looked. Your children are not here. And they are not here because of anybody else, because of you. When you brought them to have worship in the morning, you beat them with E.G. White book on their head until they don't like Jesus anymore. Are you, with, you know, you made some mistake and you dropped them and they don't like religion anymore and they call church a place of hypocrisy and you're guilty because of the way you conducted. But God has a provision. Now hear me too, those of you who are sitting here and has been dropped. You are sitting here right now and you're saying, yes, preacher man, I have been dropped. Let me tell you something. Even though you have been dropped, there is provision in the kingdom for you. Stop blaming your parents for where you are. You need to forgive them and forgive yourself. I'm going somewhere. Just wait with me. Just stick with me. But I want somehow the Holy Spirit told me while I was preparing this to talk to parents because I know as a father myself, it is often our pain, especially when we reach older men and we begin to look over like David our kingdom and we realize that there was crippleness and there was lameness in my house and you begin to carry guilt. If I had done this different, if I had done this different, oh, what about if I was a little more, if I was, uh, no, 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 no. There is grace. Trust me, fathers and mothers in this house, there is grace even though my mother died before she saw me come back to church. But when you pray, the Bible says, he holds it in a bottle. Your tears is in a bottle and God will remember your tears even though you don't see in your lifetime. God will honor the prayers you say over your children when you go to them and you must purpose in your mind that you have not brought any child in this world to be a fire stick for hell. You have brought them for the kingdom. And even though it may look like God knew before you came. Are you with me, church? I'm a, I, I, I just want you to find hope. So the nurse... She's running. She dropped down. That's the nurse. So Mephibosheth was crippled. Now watch me. Watch me. Younger people inside of here. I want to talk to you because God sent me to you tonight. Yes, you have been crippled. And you are so angry with your parents. <clears throat> I'm now crippled. I should have been a king. I would have been a king. Do you know what I would have been if my father didn't drink so much? Do you know what would have happened if he didn't go in the club and smoke when my mother was going to church? I would have been graduated from the University of Nairobi. I would have been better off. I hate that man. And, and, I, and you're angry because you were dropped. Is there anybody in this house tonight like that? You have been dropped and you're living in Lodibar. 
The Bible says that he was in Lodabar. Lo in Hebrew mean no. The bar mean word. It was a place of no bread, an empty place. I should have been in a penthouse in Kenya, but here am I in a little shamba. I eat in Kibanda, yeah. I think it is. I can't even go in a restaurant. I, I, I find myself on the street just eating a little maize here and there and eating when I should have been sitting in Kimpinski because I was a king. And say, you know what I'm talking about. I should be having meals every day in Kimpinski and, 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 and Radisson Blue. But look at me in a little Kibanda eating chapati from people. <laughs> huh? <laughs> I should have been, I should have been, and you dare, and the more you cut yourself like the demoniac in the book of uh, Mark, I think the fifth chapter, you're cutting yourself, you're miserable with yourself, instead of realizing there is grace. Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth was crippled in Lodabar. So when David, now watch me, I know I'm hurrying this sermon because I have to come back here tomorrow to preach, but you preach it to yourself, watch me. So when David became king, he said, is there yet any of the house of Saul that I may show them kindness for Jonathan's sake? <laughs> Let me tell you something, parents. God has prepared a, a David for your Mephibosheth. God, I want to say it again because I need you to hear my point. God has prepared a David for your Mephibosheth. God has prepared somebody to make up for your failures. I want to tell you that today because when I was born, three months after I was born, I fell. I fell out of my house and I damaged my neck. Up to today, my neck can't stay straight and I damaged the broker area of my brain and I couldn't talk well until I was 14 years. I, I couldn't talk well. This man that is preaching today was like a rejected son and God has brought me a mighty long way. I went to university at 23 without a single O level or a single A level. Today I have a PhD. I'm called Dr. Duncan. Not because I'm so bright, but because there is a God that has a Jonathan waiting to bless. God has blessed me with so much wisdom now because God has a way of making up for the, your deficiency. And even though I was dropped by my father, dropped by everyone, Everybody else, there is a Jesus that will never let you down. He will pick you up. Let me tell you something. God has a David waiting for your failures. So mothers and fathers, especially some of you see them, stop going around with this guilt. There is grace for your children. Grace there. Let me say this else. Don't misread Ellen White. God, some of you read mind, character, and personality and take it in a certain way and read it and get nervous. Let me tell you something. God is too wise. Hear me, Father. Hear me, Father. Hear me, Mother. God is too wise to leave the eternal destiny of your child in your hands. I want to say it again. God is too wise to leave the destiny of your child in your frail hands. Too wise because if he did that all our kids will be lost because all of us are broken people i didn't choose this my sermon last night was lame from my mother's womb we have been damaged from our mother's womb i never had a father wrong me so how could i learn to father the reason why I'm so angry, the reason why I have temper problem, the reason why I'm like this is because I never had an example. And I'm perpetuating this. So children who are sitting here tonight, please forgive these parents. Release them from your thoughts. And your mind. And you parents, release yourself from the guilt because God is a gracious God. Are you with me, church? And so he said, is there yet any of the house of Saul, that I may show them kindness for Jonathan's sake. Watch me, watch me. Some of you are a testimony of being blessed for somebody else's sake. Have you ever been to, to Afia House? Of, uh, let me see if I can remember these names. Or, or you went in some agency of government, somewhere to get something, and somebody said, who are you? Are you, are you 
Mary's daughter or are you Mary's son? And because of Mary, you get favor. Mm -hmm. For Jonathan's sake, because of your mother and because of how your father lived, you get favor. Well, the favor is not based on what you have done. It is based on what your parents did. Well, Mephibosheth is broken. And God says, David says, is there any? And then Ziba, watch me. Watch me. Just bear with me. Are you with me tonight? Just bear with this preacher. This is the last, or almost the last. Just bear with me. He, he says, he says, he says, is there any? Then Ziba said, yes, there is one, Mephibosheth. He's in Lodibah. And then the Bible says, David says, go and fetch. Go and fetch. Not tell him to come. Grace and salvation have nothing to do with sinners coming to me, but it's me going to them. It's a model and a pattern in scripture. You fetch the sinners. You don't sit in Nairobi Central or sit in Gloryland or sit in New Light and wait for people who have stumbled to come back. Grace is a way God has set it up. It is me coming to you and me begging you to come back into the fold. That is why God sent Jeremiah and Isaiah and Hosea and so many prophets to his broken children to plead with them, come back home. Many a times you say, Ephraim, how can I give you up? How can I let you go? But we have a whole set of church people today that if you just talk to a man twice, you feel you have had enough. But, oh God, just Jesus. You feel you have had enough, but God has been pursuing you forever. God has been pursuing you for the 50 years you are on earth. But a brother slips in church and two, three times you talk to him. Two, three times you communicate to him. And then you begin to say, time to let him go. If God used your measuring rod, none of us here will be inside this church. If God used the rod we use and call it some standard, none of us will be able to stand in this place. God has been so merciful to us and he expects us to be merciful to people. And that is how you express that you have been with Jesus. If you know the heart of Jesus, it will be a heart flowing with prodigal love. He said, is there yet any? Go and fetch him. I wish there was a little child in here tonight. I wish there was a little child just to demonstrate. Is there? No, no, no. There's only big people here, boy. Oh, God. Mm, big people. But, but, but in other words, he said, he said, go and fetch him. So, so, because he was crippled, because he was crippled, he just went. I, I, I know I can't lift him up, but he just went and fetched. Fetch. This is salvation. God coming and holding you in his hand. And when you find you are moving, it is not your feet is in the ground. You know that, that, old, um, that old poem thing with the footstep in the sand? It is not you. It is God who has fetched you. That is salvation. God fetching you and bringing you to him. That is salvation in scripture. And God in the text. He brought Mephibosheth. When Mephibosheth came to David, he was nervous. Because oftentimes, when people come back to church, when people have been forgiven by church, they are nervous because as if you want to keep a, a hammer over their head. I'm watching you. I forgive you, you know, but I have a sword here to kill you. you a machete in my hand. You raise your head, I cut it off this time. <laughs> hmm? So Mephibosheth went in the ground and he told David, he said, I'm but a dead dog. Because oftentimes when you come back like the prodigal son, you think you're a dead dog, but church, hear me good. God don't see you as no dog. God don't see you. He sees you like a son. His blood, his blood, his blood has washed away your sins. And he treats you like you have never... Ooh. 
That's the gospel. I wish to God. We think it's just the three angel message and you have revelation. The real brass tacks at the bottom of it, when he comes, he's saying, I was in prison. Did you visit me? You figure he's asking about 1844 and the Sabbath. No, no, no. I was in prison. Did you come? I was hungry. Did you feed me? I was naked. Did you clothe me? That is what is in uh, Matthew chapter 25. All these big things that we think God is looking at, he's just looking at the little, how are you treating me? How are you treating the widows in your church? Are you respectful to them? How are you treating my sinners, those people who sin and fall? How? That is what I'm interested in, in church. Not those big stuff and no beasts, or the beasts and beasts and horn and horn. You could tell me how much about beasts and horn and I suffering, not hearing. Try to close this message. So he said, Are you? He brought him. And then watch me. You know the text. But but I, I want to stick on that one. And I'm going to leave out a lot of nice, juicy stuff in the text. You read it as I try to finish. He said, So he brought Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth says, I'm a dog. He said, No, 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 no. Mephibosheth, I will restore to you all that belong to the house of Saul. Brethren, it wasn't 10 years, it wasn't 5 years, it wasn't 20 years. From the time somebody asks for forgiveness and you forgive them, you restore. That is scripture. I can show you it many places. This idea about penance and you leave me 10 years. I, yes, I went and I had fornication. And the truth is, the only reason why some of you not... Oh, let, me, let me don't say that. But let me talk about Trinidad, my country. The reason why some of them... Huh? Because you have never got caught. It's not that you never did. And it's not that you never did. It's because you never got caught. But if God was to expose you, who is so quick to raise your hands in condemnation of people? If God was not so merciful to expose you, and you notice I'm not looking at anybody. You, you, you. If he was to expose you, but because of his mercy and grace, and he said, yes, this is how I want you to behave. Because you know, you who sit in judgment over people, you who sit, you know who you are. Stop be behaving as if you are some righteous man. Don't let me expose you because you know you don't want me to expose you. So behave yourself. <laughs> behave yourself. And, and so he called Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth, he said, I will restore to you all oh, that was the kingdom of Saul. And in fact, I will give you the servants of Ziba. And Ziba has 13 sons or 12 sons uh, that, that serve this crippled man. Now he's restored. And the king says, <laughs> David said, now you will sit on my table. Now, if you know the palace, the palace has many rooms. The palace has many places to eat. But David didn't say, go and sit on other table." He said, you will come and sit on my table. You know when people are forgiven that, that is what I want the church to get. We don't put them on a side desk. <laughs> we don't put them on a side table. They come to sit on my table. I, wait a minute, preacher. When I look at the table, I see the mighty man of David sitting. When I look at the table, I see Amnon, the king's kid. I see Tamar, the king's daughter. I see Solomon and Absalom. And here it is, Mephibosheth, who was broken, who are an enemy, is sitting in state house. Mm, he's sitting in state house. Broken as he is, he's in the state house. Now, when you watch Mephibosheth, when you watch Mephibosheth, he's at the table. His hands can move. His head can move. His body can move. But the tablecloth, the tablecloth of the table blocks his foot. So when you look at him, he looks like a normal son. Because my Bible tells me, love covers a multitude of sin. So when you sit at the king's table, the food on the table is that which will remedy your malady. He said, and you shall sit on the king's table continually and shall eat bread. I want to close my text tonight by focusing on one word. 
in verse 12. It says, so Mephibosheth, verse 12, verse 12, and I will end there and let you read. Verse 12 says, and Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. When a crippled man has a son, most times his son has a problem. Because the Bible says the seed brings forth after his kind. That's a law that is immutable and cannot change. And the reason why I want to stick a pin by this text, because he was broken, he was crippled, but he had a son. I, I, I was crippled, but, but I fathered children. I, I had insecurities because when I damaged my brain when I was small, I, my self-esteem was low, so I was crippled and I have children. And so I see my traits in my kids and, and Mephibosheth had a son. And, then, and, and, and some of you have been abused and sexually abused and, and verbally abused by people you have so traumatized. And, so, and you yourself was crippled and then you have a son. And then, and then you see the same things and you're depressed and Mephibosheth had a son. How could I play with my kids outside? I don't even know what is that because my father never played with me. Mephibosheth had a son. Some of you, if not all of us, broken, but we have sons. And all we see is a perpetuation of that thing. And we want to know if there is hope. But as I illustrated to you on Sabbath, which I will illustrate again, I wouldn't take a Bible, I'll take a hymn book. If I put this kerchief, which represents us, inside of this book, which represents Adam, if Adam fell, the kerchief is fallen too. Whatever ha happened to Adam has happened to me. I didn't do anything to fall. I was just in Adam, so I fell. Well, the scripture gives us hope. Now we are in Christ. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Now that I am Christ, what has happened to him has happened to me. That is why Paul say, I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places. And so you may see me looking like this, but I'm really in heaven. He's a conqueror, and I am more than conqueror. And let me tell you why I'm more than conqueror and I send you home to rest and for some of you to eat your tilapia. Achy, achy, achy. Muhammad Ali, the world know him. When he came to Africa, they loved him. Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali was a conqueror. Muhammad Ali would train in the morning and he trained in the summer and train and he's boxing. Muhammad Ali was great. He was wonderful. He will go. He beat Drew Fraser. Wonderful. He's a conqueror. Hey, he beat Norton. Norton broke his jaw. And he, when Muhammad Ali was great. He will train. He was the greatest. He was so handsome. He was, had so much rhyme. Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali. Great. He was a conqueror. Now, when he fought his last, well, not his last fight, but a fight where he made about 30 million. When Muhammad Ali fight and he knocked down the guy and they presented him with a check. Now he have a check. He's a conqueror. He have a check. Then he goes home and he gives the check to the wife. He was a conqueror, but his wife was more than a conqueror. He was more than a conqueror because she did nothing. He was the one who took the blows. He was the one who did the training. But when he won, he said, look, that is who Paul says we are in the book of Romans 8 chapter. For we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. And even though it may seem like we are weak, but we are more than conquerors, let us take our status and know who we are. I want to make a call tonight, raising what I want to happen. And as I made a confession before God tonight, Aburi told me nothing. I just come and preach. But the agenda is, I have an agenda for God's people and God's church, that we all love one another, all embrace each other, and be in one accord. Could we stand to our feet as we pray?
Tomorrow is another day in God's house. I want as we go, we purpose in our heart to hug somebody, to make up with somebody, to go and hold somebody who behave like David and say, is there anybody out there that offended? Is there, and look them or go and fetch them. Go look for them. Jump in your car, drive by their house, be there first thing in the morning. That brother or that sister is probably waiting on you. You don't even know. Get the courage to go. Go and say, I love you. And hug and kiss and make up. Are you with me, church? I dare you, if you follow, God will bring such revival in this place. You'll be shocked. Because everywhere, saints hug and make up. There is a wind of revival. And the Holy Spirit will fill this place. It's up to you. It's up to you. Bow our heads and close our eyes as we pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to be in your house. Your people have listened to your words, listened to your message. I pray, O oh God, that you will give us the courage to go and fetch Mephibosheth and put him on the table and even though you know he's still lame on his feet, you still give him food to eat at your table. May we, O oh God, behave like you in this house. With the church say, Amen. Amen. Please be seated.